Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Lord, we ask that you would illuminate the word and apply it to our lives. Amen. Good morning. And I just want to thank the church again for pastor appreciation. Um, as I've said many times, it's just an honor and a privilege. It's awesome. It's humbling to be uh, the pastor of this church. And I appreciate you so very, very much. I want to read some scripture from the book of Mark. I kind of alluded to that last Sunday, so we're going to do it. Mark 9, 38 to 50. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make, a salt, make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of those words for this morning. A few years ago, there was a Mensa convention in San Francisco. Everybody know what Mensa is? Mensa, of course, is the organization whose members have an IQ of 140 or higher. I just miss it. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Several of the members were having lunch at a local cafe during this convention. And while they were there, they were eating uh, lunch, they discovered that the salt shaker contained pepper and the pepper shaker contained salt. Now, the Mensa members, being naturally inquisitive, began to uh, question how they could swap the contents of those two bottles without spilling any of it, the contents using only the implements at hand. What was at the table? After all, this was clearly a job for the best minds available. So anyhow, the group debated and they presented ideas to one another and finally came up with a, a very brilliant solution involving a napkin, a straw, and an empty saucer. Got it set. Then they called the waitress over to their table because they were convinced that they could dazzle her with their solution. She came over and they said, ma'am, we couldn't help but notice that the pepper shaker contains salt and the salt shaker contains pepper. She looked at it and she said, oh, I'm sorry about that. And without further content, she unscrewed the caps of the two, switched the caps, put them back on the bottles and said, now, will that be one check or separate check? Bada boom. I guess the Menza guys learned something about common sense that day. But I want to talk about salt shakers this morning. Salt shakers. Jesus described his followers as salt of the earth as part of the Sermon on the Mount that we read in Matthew 5. 
He said, you are the salt of the earth. This is Matthew I'm speaking about. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, these words follow the Beatitudes. They come right after the Beatitudes, which are often interpreted as referring to Jesus' expectations of his disciples. Think about that. Not just the 12 that were with him, but his disciples. All of us. Mark uses the same imagery in today's lesson. He said salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? If salt loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? When something loses its essential quality and fails to perform its essential duty of what it's supposed to do, it's good for nothing but to be thrown away. Whether it's salt, pepper, I don't care what it is. If it can't do what it's supposed to do, you got to get rid of it. Now in Jesus' day, salt was really valuable commodity. Salt was valuable for two big reasons. As a preservative for food and to enhance the flavor of food. Now we all know the essential salt is for enhancing the taste of food. I mean, on some of our most popular dishes, something that you really like or I like, salt really brings out the flavor, does it not? Some people just really give it a go. But salt can be overused. In 1853, George Crumb was a chef in New York City, and he accidentally invented a popular new dish. There was a very annoying patron who kept sending his French fried potatoes back to the kitchen because he said they were too soggy. In an attempt to, cheat, to teach this customer a lesson, Crumb sliced the fries extra, extra, extra thin, as thin as he could cut them. And then he fried them in oil till they were just absolutely crisp. And then he covered them with salt. To his surprise, the complaining customer actually liked the converted fries and thus potato chips were invented. What does potato chips taste like without salt, right? Some of us have tasted it, it may no good. It is no good. Uh, how about french fries? Oh yeah, you gotta have salt on french fries. Or for that matter, popcorn. Obviously we can overindulge in our salt, what we put on it. But very few people voluntarily go on a completely salt-free diet. You may have to for medical reasons, but on your own, you're not going to do it. When Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth, maybe he was saying that we should bring flavor, bring the flavor to life as he brought flavor to life. <clears throat> woman wrote Ann Landers. I don't know if there's an Ann Landers or not anymore, but the column's still there. And she wrote this letter to Ann, and uh, she had a complaint. <clears throat> she said in her letter, <clears throat> she said, I'm 44. My husband's the same age. He's a great guy. We get along really good together. No drinking, no gambling, no skirt chasing. He has a good job, and our home is paid for. Our kids are healthy and they're normal. They do well in school. And the three teenagers have never give us an ounce of trouble. Never. So why am I writing to you, Anne? She said. She said, because my life is blah. Something is missing in my life. It's like stew without salt. I feel a certain emptiness. Can anybody identify with this complaint? Is your life kind of empty? Many people in our society have that emptiness within their lives. They just do. Like this woman, their lives are kind of blah. I hope your life is not blah. 
Something is missing. And as this woman described her life, it's like stew without salt. So how do we bring flavor to people's lives? How do we do that as Christians? We do it by showing them genuine concern. Show them genuine concern. We let them know that someone cares about them. I'd like to think that uh, the followers of Jesus would be kind and helpful to anyone who was struggling. We want that. We want to be part of that. Anytime we show genuine concern for someone else, we are making this world a better place. We are adding flavor to their lives. We are showing ourselves to be the salt of the earth. There was a woman named Martha who was fortunate enough to run into a group of uh, women who were most certainly qualified as salt of the earth. Martha is a 26-year-old girl, woman, uh, that, that contracted ALS, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, it most generally affects men. Martha needed a lot of help. When this group of women from Evanston, Illinois, heard about Martha, they, they jumped into action. They began giving Martha round-the-clock nursing care. They bathed her. They fed her. They prayed for her. And they witnessed to her. Martha, who had not received Christ up to that point in her life, couldn't understand how a loving God, how a loving God could let her get ALS. But when she saw God's love in these women, eventually she became a follower of Jesus. Don't you imagine there was a rejoicing time in heaven when these women jumped into action to help Martha? Don't you think God was happy and Jesus was happy and the angels were dancing? Got to be. Jesus said to his followers that they were the salt of the earth. And that was very high praise. That was a big compliment to be called the salt of the earth. We are to bring flavor to the lives of everyone around us. Everyone around us. By our genuine concern for them. Are you concerned about your fellow man that you come in contact with? See, that's the first thing that salt does. Salt brings flavor. <coughs> Traditionally, salt has played an even more important role in the lives of human beings. <coughs> for many generations, it was the only preservative people had for food. Before the modern miracle of refrigeration, people were limited in the foods that they could enjoy because they were limited in preserving foods, especially meat. They couldn't keep meat. They couldn't keep any food, really. In his book titled Salt for Society, Philip Keller recounts many of his experiences as a kid growing up in East Africa. His family lived at the equator under severe tropical conditions. There was no refrigeration available to them for his first 18 years on this, on this, in his life. As a result, his family had no way of preserving meat, fish, fruit, or vegetables. So they had to use salt to preserve their food. <clears throat> meat in particular would rapidly decay under the withering conditions of the equator's weather, and salt was the only ingredient that could slow the process. So he recalls how tons and tons of beef and lamb and wild game were cut up into slender strips that were soaked in a salt solution, and then the strips were hung out in the hot equator's sun to dry. The strips of things that we call jerky. Salt both preserved the food in the intense heat and offered great strength 
when it was consumed. It was good. That's always been so. Salt was so valuable that Roman soldiers received allowances of salt as part of their pay. And thus the word salary comes into effect. In various eras of Ethiopia, various places, and other parts of Africa, they've used cakes of salt to pay their debts. You pay people what you owed them with salt. Salt has been considered very valuable in our land also. During the Civil War, General Sherman of the Union Army charged one of his captains with aiding and abetting the enemy for letting the rebels acquire salt. He said, without salt, they can't make bacon. They can't keep their beef. Salt is eminently contraband. He said, because of its use in curing meats, without it, the army of the South cannot support itself. We can't overemphasize how important salt was to earlier societies, including our own. The question is, how do we as followers of Jesus, you and I, serve as a preservative in our time. Aren't we those who have been entrusted with the task of preserving our future generations for good, the good news of Jesus Christ? Isn't that our job as Christians? Isn't that the essential task of the people of Christ? To be a witness to his presence in the world? Isn't that what we're to do? Along with giving flavor, but being a witness? There was a popular TV commercial some years back. You probably have seen it. It showed two golfers, and they're playing a round of golf. And as they went along, a voiceover accompanies their efforts. And it would say, greens fees, $116. Graphite shaft clubs, $877. Lunch at the turn, $13.50. Balls and tees, $36. And then came the clincher. As one of the guys makes a miraculous tee shot that takes two bounces on the green and rolls into the cup, the boy says, hole in one and a witness, priceless. There are many things money can't buy, but for everything else, there's MasterCard. You know what? If I ever hit a hole in one, that's certainly what I want. I want a witness. Believe me, I want a witness. Otherwise, nobody's going to believe it. What Jesus wants are witnesses. You and I, witnesses. Salty witnesses. People who will witness to their generations that Christ is alive and at work in this world. How's anybody going to know unless we do it? You and I. People, he wants people who will testify to the difference his presence has made in their lives. People who, because of their credibility, will make it possible to preserve the teachings of Christ for later generations. We each need to ask the question whether our lives, yours and mine, would convince people that Jesus is alive by the difference he has made in their lives. Are we a witness for our Lord? Are we as we sit here today? Are we adding flavor to the world? A few years ago, a very popular Christian book came out. You may have read it. Titled, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. It was subtitled, Evangelism as a Way of Life. 
It was authored by a woman named Rebecca Pippert. Now Jesus said, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Ms. Pippert's thesis is this, salt is good, but if salt stays in the salt shaker, what good is it? How can it flavor life if it stays in the shaker? How can it preserve food if it stays in the shaker? How can we get the salt that will change our world out of the shaker? Really, there's only one way, and that is for the followers of Jesus, you and I, to live as Jesus lives, showing his love for all the world to see. Are you the salt of the earth? Jesus said, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? There's only one way for that to happen. That's by each of us drawing closer to him so that his love will radiate through us. You are the salt of the world said Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. What shall we render to God for all the benefits we have known? We will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of our God. We remember how Jesus said, I do not call you servants any longer but I have called you friends. We assemble then as friends of Jesus, remembering his name and his life given for us. We remember Paul's words, you are the body of Christ. We assemble as Christ's living body in the world to renew our understanding of the truth that is a symbol and commitment. Almighty God, there are mysteries in the deep riches of the gospel that we have not yet reached. There are heights that we dare not climb and depths we dare not face. Strengthen our resolve and reveal more of the meaning of your word to us in this time of worship. John 15, 9 through 12 says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let us pray. Lord, you give tough instructions. Loving you first with heart and soul is heavy in itself. Then comes this word to love one another as you have loved us. It is more than we can accomplish in a lifetime, but help us to make a meaningful beginning in this simple greeting of one another. Amen. All of you who are in love and fellowship with your brothers and sisters who do earnestly and truly repent of your sins, and who humbly put your trust in Christ and desire his help that you might lead a more godly life, draw nigh to God and receive these emblems to your comfort and wholeness through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 11, 23 through 26 says, For I receive from the Lord what I have handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At this time... Take your bread, which we also give thanks to the one who made it. We have real bread. Let's pray. 
God, sometimes we think no one cares, and then we touch the hand that says, I do. Sometimes we feel no one understands, and we meet a pair of eyes that says someone does. Sometimes we feel alone and a smile that says we aren't. Sometimes we are lost, and you give us a cup that reminds we are found. So you give us this bread, O oh God. We break it and share its goodness. Remember Jesus. Enjoy the miracle of his love. Amen. So take this bread as we say together, the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Let us see. Let us pray. We hold in our hands a symbol of life, the resources of Christ. Let us remember that, that this communion which we drink, which is the blood of Christ, we will always remember how it is he who shed his blood for each one of us. In his name we pray. Amen. In the same way, we take, as we say, this cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Let us drink. Let us pray. O oh God, we have lived through many remembrance in this time of worship. You have set us against our comp competitions and struggles for status. Call us to our simple servanthood. If our remembering makes us more willing to serve and be served, it is a time of rejoicing. You have set it against all of our temptations to fracture community, your call, to be genuine fellowship. Replace all dissension, all speculation, and all idle assumptions with conversation, an action that bear witness to our caring for one another. If we can live in that manner, it will be a time of rejoicing. O oh God, you have set against our deep-rooted tendency to earn our salvation, a simple piece of bread in a small cup. They remind us of our inability to serve ourselves and our sure need of the life you have granted us in Jesus Christ. If we can receive this blessing to our health and our wholeness, it is a time of rejoicing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It says it all. There might be somebody out there struggling. And we're here, and they need help. What do we do? We are the salt of the earth. We have been given a, a commission. We have been given a duty to go to that person, to lift them up, to be a part of their lives. We are the light that's burning. We are the salt of the earth. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Lord God, we, we thank you so much for the opportunities you've given us to reach out. So many times we, we fail to do it. We find other things to do. Our lives get complicated and we can't seem to find time. But Lord, we have been given the commission. We are the salt of the earth. And we ask that you would continue to guide and direct us and prod us on that we might be the salt of the earth to those who are struggling. Until we meet again, amen.